Ephesians chapter number one. Ephesians chapter number one, and we're going to get right into the the lesson tonight. Ephesians chapter number one, and let's go ahead and look at verse number one, and we'll read down to verse number six. You can remain seated tonight. Ephesians 1 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now, by way of introduction tonight, I do want to go ahead, and this is a Bible study, and so I want to make sure that we are studying as a group and that you're learning from the study. So uh, you can, if you can just yell out the answer when you know the answer. These are basic questions from just the very short uh, time that we've looked at the book of Ephesians. Let's start with the easiest question, all right? Who wrote the book of Ephesians? All right, hopefully everybody got that one. Here's, here, this actually might be the easiest one. I said that was the easiest one. This might be the easiest. Who was it written to? The, but specifically to the, to what? The people of Ephesus, to the believers in the church in Ephesus. But yes, if you said Ephesians, we know what you meant. If you said the church of Ephesus, or if you said people in Ephesus, we know what you meant. But yes, specifically to the believers in the church in Ephesus. And you know what's interesting is, it, it seems like anymore you go to a town and you find five, six, seven, eight, maybe even more, depending on how, how big a town, churches. And this time, Paul just simply addressed it to, the, to these believers at Ephesus, to this ch one church. And there was only one church in Ephesus that was preaching and teaching Jesus Christ. So the address was a, a lot easier than in our day. If we were to address it simply to the church at Atwater or in Atwater, it would make it a lot more difficult because of all the many churches around here. But he addressed it specifically to those believers. All right. Where was Paul when he wrote this letter? In jail. And where was that jail or where was that prison? In Rome. All right. Good. Now, here's one that might be a little bit tougher because I think I only mentioned it one time. We know that this book was written between a four year period. We don't know the exact date, but it's between a four-year period of what dates? A.D. Does anybody know? I only mentioned it once. This one's tougher. A.D. 60? A.D. 60? No. No. A four-year period, brother. A.D. 60 to A.D. 64. All right? Somewhere in those four years. Now, remember, we don't know for sure if this was written at the tail end of the book of Acts when he spent two years in a hired house. So he may have been a prisoner, but he may not have been in a prison cell when he wrote this. However, based off of the writings we find in this uh, letter and the other three prison letters, there's a pretty good chance he's not in the hired home anymore. There's a pretty good chance he is actually in a Roman prison. Now, all right, those were easy questions. I just wanted to get those out of the way real quick. Tonight, I do want us to look at verse number six. Look at that verse with me once again. And the Bible says here, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And this is what I want to talk about tonight, accepted by grace. Now, we said that verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 are one sentence, but they've been divided into four verses. The translators of the Bible, the King James Bible, translated them into four verses because there are four principles 
found in these four verses. Now remember, this is one sentence, so there is cohesion throughout these four verses. They are correlated or they're related, and so they work together just like a sentence should, but because it's such a long, drawn-out, run-on sentence, there are four principles found in these four verses, and so therefore they divided up, divided this sentence up in that way. So real quickly, by way of review, let's talk about the first three uh, principles. The first principle is all blessings come from God. From verse number three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So we said that everything that has happened in our life that has been good is from God. And remember, the Bible told us that every good gift and every perfect gift uh, is from God. It's from above, which cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness. And so we need to acknowledge that. By the way, when we talked about the fact that all blessings are from God, I mentioned to you that so often in the day and age in which we live, we focus on the negative and we focus on all the things that are going on wrong around us. Uh, probably every one of us tonight, if I were to just say Ferguson, Missouri, you would know what that's about if you kept up with the news at all in the last two weeks. If I were to say Israel or Palestine, you would know what I'm talking about. Why? Because these are things that the media is promoting. These are things that the media is emphasizing and focusing on. But they're not positive things. They're not, they're not blessings. Uh, they're very negative things. And with all the negative things that are addressed in, and focused on in our society, it is important that every day we do like the, the old hymn says, and we count our blessings. I would challenge you every day when you have your personal devotions to get a little notepad and to try to write down five to ten things that you are thankful for and or five to ten blessings that you can uh, you can give God credit for in your life, whether it's that day or that week or this month or this year or just in your lifetime. But don't forget the blessings of God, because so often people turn away from God and they stray away from God because they forget about the blessings of God. They forget about what he's done. It's just like with sports. In sports, anybody who, who watches baseball, football, basketball, hockey, I'm not sure if tennis is considered a sport. Just kidding, because I know that Miss Caitlin and Brother Ken like tennis. I'm just joking. No, but in any sport, people follow either a person or a player. And there's a mentality out there now, what have you done for me lately? You know, and, and I think about the fact that people are always talking about the here and now. For example, because we're not far from the Bay Area, many of you know, I'm a Dodgers fan, but I listen to uh, a lot of these Giants fans as they call in and, uh, to some of the radio shows, and some of them are disgruntled. They're upset uh, what's going on with their team. But if you look at it, their team's won two World Series in, what, the last four years or something. I mean, we forget about the good things that God has done for us so often when things are trying and when things are tough in our lives. So we need to remember, number one, that all blessings are from God. The second principle we've learned all believers should live holy and blameless. Verse number four, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Remember, knowing the fact that God uh, chose uh, us, and when we say chose us, we mean that he chose a way for us to get to heaven before the foundation of the world, and that he already planned on not only saving anyone who would receive his son Jesus Christ as Savior, but that they he would also bless them, we should be motivated to live holy and to live without blame. And remember, when we say blameless or without blame, we're talking about not bringing blame on the name of Jesus Christ, not causing people to turn away from Jesus. Probably the saddest statement I hear when I'm out door knocking, and it doesn't happen often, but when I'm out, if someone were to say to me, I would go to church, but, or I would become a Christian, but, and then they follow it up with, I know too many Christian hypocrites. Or I know too many people that go to that church that are, are Pharisees. That, that would bother me because we're not supposed to bring blame to the name of Jesus Christ. We're not supposed to cause it to be a name of shame, but it's supposed to be elevated to where people know there's something different about Christians. The Christians have something that others don't have. And it shouldn't be that they're, uh, they're filled with arrogance and pride, but that they have something and it's the power of God on their lives. And how do we get the power of God? By living holy. 
by living blameless. Third principle we looked at on Sunday night in verse number five. The third one is God wants every person to be saved. Nothing new there, but something we forget about so often as we go through our daily routine. Verse 5, having, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. God is not willing that any should perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance. He wants everyone to be saved. And once again, just like with the fact that God uh, is, is the one who gives us all blessings and God is the one who uh, shows a way for us to be saved, this fact, knowing that God uh, has adopted us into his family and predestinated a way into his family called adoption, uh, way before the world was created, that ought to motivate us to tell other people about Jesus Christ. Knowing that it's the will of our Father, once again, if you had a good relationship with your father growing up or you have a good re relationship with your father now, you want to please him. You want to do what his will is or what he wants. And you try to do whatever you can to make him happy because you love him and you know you owe a lot to him. Well, if we know that it's the good pleasure of his will that people be saved, that more men and women and teenagers and young people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, then we ought to be motivated to tell more people. The next principle we see in the final one from this sentence now is in verse number six. And we're going to spend just a few minutes looking at this tonight. To pray to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. The grace of God is glorious. Now, once again, this, just like the other three principles we looked at, seem like very basic principles. Now, remember, this is an opening statement to a letter by Paul the Apostle. He's writing to the Ephesian believers who have been battled, who have been opposed, who have been going through a spiritual fight like, like hardly any other church had. And he, they even had some dissension within, and they had people that were perverting doctrines and men who had drawn away others from the church because they wanted to be elevated and they wanted people to follow them. And so he's addressing them, and he makes this opening statement with four basic principles. And he makes it because he's just wanting to remind them of these basic things. You know, sometimes it's not the deep things that we need to be reminded of each and every day as far as the Bible. But it's the basic things. It's the basic things that if you don't do them, you're going to have problems in your life. It's the basic things that we talk about over and over again, about reading our Bible and praying and, and telling others about Jesus. And we can come to church and we can hear it over and over again. And we can get to a point where we think to ourselves, good night, that's all we hear from the pulpit. But if we don't talk about those things, if we don't address those things, if we aren't edified or encouraged to do those things, what's going to happen? Those things are going to slip. They're going to fall by the wayside. Because we're going through a spiritual battle just like the Ephesians we're going through. We're constantly bombarded. And we know that the Bible says, and that Paul wrote uh, in his letters, that things are going to get worse and worse. Folks, we're going to see some spiritual battles like the Ephesians never saw. We're going to see some spiritual battles like the Colossians never saw. Why? Because we are getting closer and closer to the end. And we are already told it's going to get worse and worse, that means before it was better than it's going to be. All right, so we have to be reminded about these basic things. With that in mind tonight, let's talk real quickly about the glorious grace of our loving Father, the glorious grace of God. Turn with me, if you would, back to Genesis, the book of Genesis. Someone here tonight might say, Preacher, I know that God's grace is glorious, but... As I said, because it's such a simple statement and a, a basic principle, oftentimes we have to go back to the beginning to be reminded just how good God is and to be reminded of His grace and how glorious it is. Turn back to Genesis chapter number 1 with me. We're going all the way back to the beginning to creation here tonight. In Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 26, the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth 
and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. And the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Here we're told about the creation of man, and in Genesis chapter number 1, this is an overview of creation here. And we're told that man is made, and we're told the, the pronoun, a plural pronoun is used when talking about man in verse number 26, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth. So we know that God had created Adam and planned on created, creating Eve and planned on them procreating or reproducing because he gives them the command, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So here we have this overview. And in this overview... We are told that God makes them and God gives them dominion over the entire earth. Now think about it. Of course, there's a lot more people now because back then there was just two of them. But think about the fact that God in heaven has given us as mankind dominion over this earth. We've all seen things that are unbelievable. Anybody who's been to Yosemite has to have stood in awe at uh, the waterfalls there and the mountains and Half Dome and the various things there. If you've had the privilege of traveling around our country, going to the Grand Canyon, going to Yellowstone Park, uh, going over there to the Appalachian Mountains, you've seen uh, things and you look at these things and you're just amazed at them. Going to the ocean and seeing the ocean, and if you've ever gone a sightseeing uh, out on a boat to, to see the, the ocean and you've seen whales or dolphins or any kind of animals like that, you had to be in awe of this. Now think about this for a moment. Just in the things that you have seen of nature in your life, God has given us dominion over all of these things. That's pretty remarkable when you think about it. Knowing that we're nothing special. Or we don't, shouldn't think we're anything special. We, we're just human beings. But God entrusted this. To Adam and Eve, and he entrusted it to us. Look now on to chapter number 2, verse number 4. The Bible says, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So God, now we're get, getting a specific uh, testimony here of creation. In chapter number one, it was a generalization. Now in chapter number two, uh, God is using Moses to write a specific account of what happens. And so God has been watering the, uh, the earth by having this water come up from the ground. Instead of having rain, this mist comes up and waters the ground, and he creates this garden uh, that we know as the Garden of Eden, and he, he uh, creates man, creates Adam, and puts him right there. In verse number 15, the Bible goes on to say, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So God puts him there with this, this uh, responsibility that he gives to him, which is to take care of it. Now, once again, we don't know exactly what the Garden of Eden was like, but we, almost, we imagine it to be a tropical garden, a very lush place. I mean, it was being watered by God from the ground up without the, the rain. And, and it, was, it had to be a beautiful place with plenty of food because we're going to find out here in just a minute that God tells him that he can eat of any tree that's there. And so there's trees there and there, it's green and it's a beautiful place to be. And God's told him, just make sure you keep it, make sure you dress it. Verse number 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help me for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken him from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man 
And so now we're told that God sees that Adam is there. He's given Adam dominion over all the animals. He's given Adam dominion over the whole earth. He's placed him in the Garden of Eden, a lush place to be, a beautiful place to live. He's allowed him to eat whatever he wants to except off of one tree. And then he looks down and he says, I'm, uh, he needs to help me. He needs someone to, to uh, complete him. And so he brings the animals by and has Adam name all of these animals. And then the next thing you know, God causes him to fall asleep, takes a rib and creates Eve and brings Eve to Adam, brings them together. Adam has had every need provided for. He and Eve are in this beautiful place. Guess what? They don't have to worry about paying a mortgage. They don't have to worry about uh, a, a car loan. They don't have to worry about insurance. They are in this place and they are enjoying it and it's beautiful and it's green and it's, it's got food there and there's animals there and they have dominion over the animals and the animals in them have a relationship, a friendship like no other. And there's one thing that God tells them not to do. Out of all this, one thing, and we know what that one thing is. Verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. One thing you can't do. You can't eat off of this tree. And of course we know the story. Eve in Genesis chapter number 3 is there. And the devil comes in the form of a serpent, and he's subtle, and he, he begins to attack the word of God in verse number one, and he says, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And Eve responds and tells him, No, we can eat of any of the trees, just not that tree in the midst of the garden. And he goes on in verse number four and says, Ye shall not surely die. And remember, now he is not attacking the word of God, now he's twisting it. Because God was talking about a spiritual death, and Satan is talking about a physical death. And so he says, ye shall not surely die. You're not going to drop dead here. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Then she goes on and looks at that fruit, and the Bible says that because it was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took it and ate of it. Then she handed it on to her husband. He took it and he ate it. We know that story very well. Now with all that said, God was good to Adam. God was good to Eve. He had given them everything they could need, everything they could ever want. And he only required one thing of them. Don't eat off of that tree. And yet they did it. I think, like I was talking about Thomas this last Sunday morning in Sunday school, I think so often we're critical of Adam and Eve and we think to ourselves, if I would have been Adam, I wouldn't have sinned. Or we think if, if my wife had been Eve, I know she wouldn't have sinned. Or maybe you ladies think I wouldn't have given into that serpent. But remember, they were put in a perfect situation and they messed up. I'm sure that we may think we wouldn't sin, but we would. And God, remember, knew that that this was going to happen. He set it up so that they had everything they could ever want, and yet they still made that one mistake. Now, he judges them in Genesis chapter number 3. We find, in, and then in verse number 22, the Bible tells us this, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. He goes ahead and passes judgment on the serpent, on Eve, on Adam, because they're all guilty. And then he says, you know what, we've got to send him out of here because there's still a tree right there in the middle of the Garden of Eden. Besides the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there's also the tree of life. And if he goes and he takes some of the fruit off that tree of life he's, and eats it, he's going to be able to live forever. He's not going to die. And we know that it's appointed unto men once to die. God allowed Adam and Eve to enjoy all of this goodness, but because of that mistake, they were sent out of that garden. Now remember, because sometimes I think people read this story and they think that that's just unfair of God. 
Remember that Adam is dirt. And Eve came from the rib of dirt. They're nothing. We are nothing. We are the offspring of dirt and a rib from dirt that God took and made two human beings of. And if God had wanted to, he could have taken them and killed them instantly. He could have destroyed them. He could have said, that's it. I gave you guys a chance. You messed up. It's over. He could have done that. Why? Because he's God. And not just because he's God, because he's a holy and righteous God. And I think that sometimes we fail to remember his holiness, his righteousness. The Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. In other words, when we compare our goodness, and folks, we do some good things. We really do. We've done a lot of good things as human beings. We've done a lot of bad things, but we've done a lot of good things. We, as Americans, we try to help people around the world. We try to do a, a lot of humanitarian things. But when we compare our good efforts and our good deeds to God and his righteousness, our righteousness, our good deeds is like filthy rags. It's like those rags that you guys have in your garage that you wipe your oil, oily hands on. And you throw them over in the corner and, and let them dry. And you, the only thing you're going to use them for is wiping oil and grease and dirt and grime off of things. Because that's all they're good for. That's what our righteousness is compared to God. But look at verse number 24. Even though they had to be sent out of the garden. And even though they had messed up and they had sinned and they had done wrong. God still left a way for them back into the garden. Look at verse 24. So it says, so he drove out the man. And he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Have you ever thought about, and I know I've mentioned this since I've pastored here the last four and a half years. Have you ever thought about why God did what he did here in verse number 24? The Bible says he put cherubims. These are angels. He put them around this tree of life. And he put a flaming sword that turns in every way or every direction. He was protecting this tree of life but it's also symbolic it's symbolic of the way into heaven it's the way into the garden is symbolic of the way into heaven if you were to get uh, for a person to get to heaven they have to heed the message that's been given to them by god cherubims angels are messengers of god you have to heed the message and then you have to get Past the flaming sword. Remember the flame is representative of the Holy Spirit. The sword, of course, is the word of God. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter number 6 that the word of God is the sword of the Spirit. This is symbolic of the word of God. How do you, how do you get past the sword that turns in every direction? You have to take that sword out of the equation. You have to sacrifice yourself on that sword. And when we heed the message of the messengers who have been sent by God, and we receive the flaming sword, the word of God, the word of the Holy Spirit, into our hearts and into our lives, that's how we get back into the garden. That's how we get in to heaven. That's back, the way back to the tree of life. By the way, if you ever do it, it's a good study. Look at where the tree of life is mentioned later on in the, book, in the Bible. It's mentioned in the book of Revelation. Study that out. It's pretty interesting. Now, with all that said, though it looks like there's no way back into the garden, though it looks like it's hopeless, God still left a way for Adam and Eve to be reunited and have that fellowship with him once again. And that's through salvation. We don't have time to look at it tonight because we're running out of time right now. But in Genesis chapter number four, we actually have this illustrated for us. What caused Adam and Eve to sin? It was the lack of faith in God's word. God said, if you do this, you're going to die. The devil says, you're not going to die. He just doesn't want you to know what he knows. He doesn't want you to be like him. They believed Satan more than they believed God. And so the same thing that caused them to fall, which was a lack of faith, is the same thing that would save them later on, which was faith. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith. See, God could have been a, uh, an un, 
just ruler, an unjust God. And he could have said, okay, Adam and Eve, you've messed up. You didn't have faith in me. You didn't have faith in my instructions or my word. And so what I'm going to make you do is you're going to have to live on this earth for 60, 70, 80 years. And you're going to have to be as good as you possibly can be. And at the end of those 60, 70, 80 years, I'm, I'm going to take your life and then I'm going to bring you up and I am going to judge you. And if I think your good works uh, outweighed your bad works, I'll let you into heaven. That would be pretty unjust. I mean, because how would you know whether or not your good works were more than your bad works? But that's not what he did. He says, no, I'm going to be just. I'm going to be more than just. I'm going to be gracious. He says, you didn't believe me about the tree. Now, if you want to get to heaven, now if you want that fellowship renewed with me, you have to believe me. You have to trust. You have to put your faith in me. In Genesis chapter number 4, this is illustrated with Cain and Abel. For years, people have probably read this story and, and talked about what was it that caused God to not respect Cain's offering, but he respected Abel's. Well, turning back to the New Testament as we get ready to close, look at Hebrews chapter number 11, the chapter of faith. Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 6. Hebrews chapter number 11, excuse me, verse number 4, I apologize. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. The Bible says that his offering was more a more excellent sacrifice. Why? Because he offered it by faith. Cain is talked about later on in the New Testament as well in two different passages. We don't have time to look at both of them tonight, but if you would turn over with me real quickly to uh, 1 John. 1 John chapter number 3. 1 John chapter number 3 and verse number 12. The Bible says, Not as Cain who was of the wicked one and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. What made his brother's works righteous? Faith. What made his evil? Lack of faith. In Romans chapter number 14, verse number 23, once again, we don't have time tonight, but if you look over there, it says that that which is not of faith is sin. Cain brought an offering, but he didn't have faith. Abel brought an offering, and he had faith. And so God saw him, and God saw his offering, and God respected him, and God respected his offering. Cain brought his, but he didn't have faith. There's a lot of people out there that are doing good works tonight. They're going to church. They're following a religion but they don't have faith. They have good deeds, but they don't have faith. And so they're not enjoying the grace of God. With all that said, back in our text, Ephesians chapter number 1, in verse number 6, it says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. When Adam and Eve were created, they were accepted. In fact, the Bible says that after each day, God looked on what he had created and he saw that it was good. They were accepted, but when they sinned, they were no longer accepted. God, however, as we said, made that way, that way of salvation so that they could be accepted once again. God wanted to receive them back into his family. He wanted to have that fellowship restored. And so he made that way. And Paul here at the end of uh, this sentence, this opening sentence, he says, we are saved and we're saved to the praise of the glory of his grace. In other words, tonight, you and I should never forget the grace of God. Because though we looked at Adam and Eve tonight, and we talked for just a moment about Cain and Abel, the truth is, is that you and I, if our names were written in this Bible tonight and our stories were recorded, uh, we would have numerous times recorded about us when we sinned against God and when we disobey God. Adam and Eve, they sinned in the Garden of Eden, and that's what's recorded. And we condemn them. But we, were, we are, are sinners that deserve to die and go to hell. But because of the grace of God, we not only don't go to hell, but we've been accepted in the beloved. Amen. 
That beloved, that term beloved is something that's applied obviously to those that are believers, those that are Christians. But it means greatly loved. We're accepted into this group known as the greatly loved. The beloved. Why? Because of the grace of God. His unmerited favor. Not because of something we've done, but because we simply believed. Tonight, we need to think about God's grace and how glorious it is. We sing that song, and we're going to have it playing for us here in just a moment for our invitation. Amazing grace. You know what? I think that the longer I'm saved, the longer I battle with the fact that God's grace is amazing. Because you see, the day I got saved, I knew His grace was amazing. Because I knew I deserved to die and go to hell. And I felt like a wicked, worthless sinner. But now being saved for over 20 years, and being in the ministry, being a pastor, serving God, door knocking, reading my Bible, praying, I don't, I don't think always appreciate the grace of God. Because if it wasn't for His grace... Where would I be tonight? I know where I'd be, and I know where I'd be going. And so tonight, let me remind you that God's grace is glorious. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for all that you've given to us. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us.